will create a new earth. This new Jerusalem will be a place where God will dwell profoundly and personally with all who have asked Jesus to be the leader of their lives. Heaven is real, and as we read, it is the type of life in relationship to God and one another that we were originally created to enjoy. So let's begin by opening our Bibles or following along on the screen or in your bulletins as I read Revelation 21, 1 to 7. Then I saw a new earth and a new heaven, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. <clears throat> I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will freely give from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Thank you. <clears throat> if you're a, a guest with us this morning, I'll, I'll back up a little bit, rewind a little bit, and give you the backstory of how we ended up in heaven. Two weeks ago, we looked at the question, is there life after death? And we looked not only to the biblical account, but we looked at near-death experiences uh, and the super string theory uh, to realize that there's good reason to believe in other uh, dimensions of, of living, other non-spatial realities. We went from there to a, a frank discussion about hell last week, that hell is a real place just like heaven is a real place. Uh, it, it is not uh, a nothing. Uh, it is not as though you go to that place for just a short period of time. It is an eternal place just like heaven, but it is an eternal place of darkness, uh, torture, anguish, and torment. My job, as I stated last week, is to keep you out of hell, uh, to usher you into heaven, and that brings us to the topic today, heaven. Heaven is a, a real place, and when it comes to understanding things about heaven, the authority on heaven is the Bible. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians. He says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at the right hand in the place of honor and power. Now, when it comes to the reality of heaven, religion is not this mountain as some people would like to propose. You know, there's this religious, spiritual mountain out there, and, well, all sides of the mountain lead to the top. Hmm. The only problem with that is, is what is the top all about? What is the, the summit of spirituality? What is it really all about? And as you look at world religions, you'll realize that the heaven that the Bible describes is not the same thing as reincarnation. It doesn't jive with what the Buddhists say. In fact, the, uh, the heavenly dwelling place is, well, it's described differently than what the Muslims describe in the Koran. I believe that just empirically, if you lined up all the options, do I want reincarnation, nirvana, uh, this description of heaven, or the biblical description of heaven, I think everybody's going to pick the biblical description of heaven. 
And the reason for that is, is because it is the most accurate description of what we yearn for in terms of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What it would really be like to be with God. So heaven is a real place, just like hell is a real place. And I think the experiences of near-death experiences, the possibility of, of, uh, of quantum physics and the super string theory, that points us in the direction that, hey, there's a reality out there that, that we are body, mind, and soul. And even though our bodies may die, our soul, our self, our spirit, it lives for all eternity. I would choose to have my soul live for all eternity in the heaven that the Bible describes. And our passage today is one of the central passages about what being in heaven will be all about. So let's look at it. Verses 1 through 5, John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. That's interesting. We'll get to that in a moment. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and the one sitting on the throne said, I am making everything new. Now, is heaven really going to be a city? Now, I know Squim is heaven's waiting room. Will heaven be like Squim? Oh, you're older. You didn't laugh at that like the... Okay, let's keep going. (laughs) John is trying to give us images, human images of what it's like to be in heaven. And Jerusalem in the Old Testament was the holy city. That was the the city you hoped to go to and, and be a part of the worship in the temple during the high holy days. And so John is saying really it is this new heaven and new earth. It's a, it's a new Jerusalem, the one that we've yearned for. And then the one sitting on the throne is Jesus Christ and he says, I am making everything new and God is making everything new. And John, Jesus says, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. Wow. We all want to be where Jesus is. There's a big difference in how we get to heaven scripturally and, well, what other world religions propose. The other world religions propose that it's all on us. And here in Revelation, John makes it very clear it's all on God. We're not making all things new on heaven and on earth. Only God can do that. And God does that on our behalf because God has an everlasting love for us. He wants us to spend eternity with Him. He wants us to be in the, in the new Jerusalem. And as he says to the disciples, if it wasn't going to be that way, I would have told you that. Because I'm going to prepare a place for you. A place. So that you can be where I am. Now the reality of the scriptures is that heaven is not up there, heaven is down here. Oh wow, that's a crazy thought, isn't it? I thought that heaven was up there and it was all about getting a a halo and wings and a little lyre to strum on a cloud for all eternity. Boring. I know most men say, boring, I, I I don't want that. That just sounds awful to me. We, that's not who we are. Human beings are industrious people. They need things to do. Oh. 
And so it is clear that the Scriptures talk about the fact that God is making all things new, and one of the things that He's going to make new is the earth. Now, human beings were created for the earth. This is where we thrive. This is where we uh, are able to be human beings to our greatest point. Aren't we? We are. Now here's a few scriptures to back that up. For he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things. As God promised long ago through the prophets. Peter chimes in. But we are looking forward to the new heavens as promised. A world where everyone is right with God. In the scriptures, I could give you more, it points us back to the fact that at, at some point in history, God will return and He will reconcile the earth to Himself and He will make not only a new heaven, but He will create a new earth, a little bit like going back to the Garden of Eden. Look at Genesis. Oh, we have this the, this understanding that human beings were in the right environment for human beings. Beautiful environment, a true environment, honest environment. And so we will one day be a part of this place, but it will be a new place. The earth will be changed for the better. And that's where we will spend eternity with God. Now I know this is a little bit, uh, maybe a different thought to you. You know, back in biblical days, all the science people saw the, the whole universe in three strata. Down in the earth, well, that was as hot as hell. They knew that already. That's why they, the, the Bible talks about hell being down. Because the further down you dug, and they had mines in those days, people realized, man, you get down there far enough, you're, you're, you're sweating, it's hot, dangerous. Then there was the atmosphere of the earth, and then above was the spiritual realm, and they had what is known as the black canopy theory in those days. That there was this black canopy that had little holes in it. That's where the stars came from. And on the other side of the black canopy was the spiritual world. So you get heaven down, you get hell down and heaven up. Okay. Not a bad way to look at it. Very human, limited way to look at it. And as we've learned more scientifically, we realize that, well, heaven is. Uh, you know, that hell is not down and up is, well, ever expanding. And the further we go, we will not finally run into heaven in our four-dimensional world. That raises a big question, then where do we go when we die? And the answer simply is, is we go to the intermediate state of heaven. And the best example I can give you about that are people who die, do they go to heaven? Yes. By the way, I'll answer another question I got uh, about a week ago, and that is does it matter whether you're cremated or not? And my answer to that is, is no, it doesn't matter. Because it's not about your earthly body, it's about your spiritual body uh, along the way. So you go immediately to heaven, but you're not to your final destination yet. It's a little bit like flying from here to New York with a, a stopover in Chicago. You don't even have to deplane. When you get to Chicago, are you on the way to New York? Yes, you are. Have you arrived at your final destination? No. No. So when we die, we're on our way to heaven. Now remember, time and space was created for us. That does not mean there isn't a sense of sequence in eternity. I don't want to say that. But eternity is not defined by time and space. 
And so we don't really realize the time frame between when we die and when we inhabit the earth. We're on our way when we die. It's not only a new place, a real place, a place created for us, but it is a new way of living, John says. He said, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. It is a a profound description of the kind of relationship we yearn for with Jesus Christ, isn't it? You know, in in our best moments, we feel this profound connection with God, don't we? I think that's one of the reasons we like coming to worship, because when we gather together, when we sing and pray together, uh, there, there's a closeness that we have with God and one another. And if we could just freeze frame those little moments, we'd say, man, I wish I could just experience this all the time. Well, heaven is experiencing that experience all the time. That's not exceptional. It's normal. Because right now, God is, well, amongst us in the Holy Spirit. But He will be fully among us, personally among us, powerfully among us, when the earth is reclaimed, reconciled, and we are inhabitants of the new earth. And John makes it very clear, he, he's redefining what heaven is going to be like. God is going to be among his people. He's not going to be in the holy of holies. As he is present and moving in the Holy Spirit, that will be magnified and even more profound in his personal presence among us. It is a new way of living. It's a way of living that's, well, really, it's just all good. Just take all the goodness that you experience in life and package it up, so to speak, and imagine if you could have those good experiences only all the time. It's not as though nothing good happens in this world. A lot of good happens in this world. The difficulty is, well, a lot of difficulty and a lot of pain and a lot of suffering and even bad happens to us in this world as well. And simply take all the bad, that's what hell is like, take all the goodness, put it in one place and that's what heaven will be like. Here's how John describes it. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more more death, no more sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone and I want you to notice the final word there. Those things are gone forever. Which counters a lot of human theory about what heaven is really going to be like is all of those great negatives are gone. Those are the reasons, those are the the results of the negativity and the difficulty and the challenge that we face every day. We cry about things, we're emotional about things, we're fearful about things, we're stressed about things, we're worried about things, we're depressed about things. And when you get to heaven, you won't need those negative emotions anymore because there won't be anything to worry about. There won't be anything that stresses us out. There won't be death any longer. There won't be suffering anymore. There won't be pain anymore. And frankly, who wouldn't want to be a part of that kind of experience? Sign me up. Sign me up.
No more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. So it's not only a a way of living that that is goodness, good at its best, but it's also a, a life that comes free of charge. Free of charge. And again, Christianity stands unique against the other world religions when you talk about the free grace of God. All the other world religions say that really it's on you. If you're going to get to heaven, it's on you. Jesus says, no, it's not on you, it's on me. It's on me. I'm the one who pays the price for you to get from where you are to heaven. It's not a works righteousness. Reincarnation works righteousness. I don't know about you, but if they tallied it all up at the end of my life, a column of all the good things I said, thought, did, and the bad ones, trust me, I'm coming back like a snail. (laughs) In hot weather. I, I don't have a chance. I'm not that good. So I'm thankful that I don't believe in reincarnation. I'm thankful that it's not about me getting away from my humanity so that I might become one with the cosmos. No. The Bible says it's not about getting away from your your humanity. It is getting in touch with your humanity. Your identity is a as a child of God. That resides in each and every one of us. There's a yearning. A yearning to grow into how God created us and fashioned us. Male and female, Genesis says. We were created in His image. To all who are thirsty, John writes, I give freely from the springs of the water of life. Freely. Freely. Now that free relationship really works this way. Number one, God chose you and He wants to love you. It's about God moving in your life. It's John 3.16. God so loved the world. God so loved you that He came to this planet. Why He picked that time? I don't know. Why he picked that place, I'm not sure. Do I know that Jesus historically walked this planet? Yes, I do. Do I know that Jesus thought that he was the Son of God? Yes, I do. Do I know that Jesus resurrected from the tomb? Yes, I do. Do I understand all of that? No, I don't. Do I have to take it on faith just like you? Yes, I do. The natural and logical consequences of God taking on human form, a finite, an infinite God becoming finite and dwelling among us and then becoming the sacrificial lamb, the Jewish sacrificial lamb, who dies on the cross for our... That makes all the sense in the world to me. It makes sense to me. I don't completely understand it. (laughs) I don't completely understand love either. It's real. God loves us and He wants us to spend eternity with Him. And while He was still a long way off, the Father is looking down the path for the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son? Takes his money, goes off, blows it all. He's feeding pigs, pea pods, and says, I'd like to eat these. In fact, the servants in my father's house, they have it better than me. I'll just go home to my home and I'll be a servant. And what the child didn't know, and you know this, mothers, don't you? Especially if you have a wayward child, you look, so to speak, down the road every day, don't you? You're looking, you're watching, you're waiting, you're praying, you're hoping. 
Moms understand the parable of the prodigal son maybe even better than dads do. And see, God's been looking down the path for you since the day you were conceived. The moment you were conceived, God was looking for you. He's been standing at the door and knocking and has been calling your name. Why? Because he wants to give you this free gift that, that determines an eternal reality of being in relationship with him. God chooses us so that we can respond to him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Notice, notice the connection between Matthew and Revelation. We're thirsty. What are we thirsty for? Are we really thirsty for living water? Eternal realities, or is it all about slaking our thirst for a moment in this world? We have to choose. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. We yearn to be in our place in the family of God. And God simply says, I have a place for you, and don't worry about it, I've already taken care of everything. And because he's taken care of everything, he invites us to take our place. He chooses us so that we can choose him. It's a free gift. A free gift. Now, it's a free gift. Don't try to earn it. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. I love that about Christianity. As I have studied and gone different places in the world, it's interesting how everybody's trying to work their way into heaven. And, and you know plenty of people that do. They'll say, well, they're a good person. They're going to get to heaven. I'm, I'm a good person. I'm not a, an axe murderer, a terrorist, or a bank robber, so I'm getting into heaven. Ooh. If that were the only index for who gets to eternity, there might be something in that. And yes, there's always something good in living well, having a good attitude, serving. Those are all good things. But, you know, at the end of the day, how does it all really line up? Well, I'll tell you, the more I've learned about God, the more I've realized, boy, I don't, <laughs> I don't shape up very well. The holiness of God is a lot to live up to. And I know I don't live up to the holiness of God, that I fall short of God's glorious ideal for me. And I am thankful that it is a free gift and that I don't have to try to earn it. Does that mean we just, you know, uh, wholesale sin the rest of our lives? No, because there are natural and logical consequences to our sinful behavior. And that's why the Bible is very good about telling us this is the way you ought to live. This is the way that you will be blessed. This is how you will experience my presence and my power. And when you do these other things... Don't be surprised if you feel a long ways from me. And it isn't that God moved. In our sinfulness, we're the ones that move away from God. But even in that, God is very gracious and he forgives us our sins. He throws them as far as the east is from the west. God saved you by his grace. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. For us to receive that gift, yes, we have to empty our hands. Because it's a big enough gift, you can't just one hand it. It'll take both your hands and both your your arms, it'll take an open mind, heart, and soul to receive this free gift. That means we have to offload whatever's in our arms and our hands. 
It might be a, another way of thinking, another way of living. It might be that, well, we're very wrapped up in ourselves. And we have to take our ego and we have to set it aside. You don't have to discard your ego, by the way. You just have to set it aside. Do you know the best way to live your life? Or does God? God says, I think I have a great plan for you. It's not only a plan in this world, but it's a plan that is eternal. It will last forever, John says. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. Ephesians 1.10 This is God's purpose. He will gather us to be with Him in Christ forever. Forever. We do have the experience in this life well, certain choices that we make, they have a, a, an impact for a long time in our lives. And what John wants us to understand is, is, that, is that the afterlife is real. Hell is real. Heaven is for real. And the decisive factor of where we spend eternity, that's determined now. There are no second chances. I wish there were, but there aren't. I can't find the loophole for that anywhere in the Bible. And so how we respond to God's great invitation, it is a, an eternal determining factor. And that's why God is knocking at every door. That's why God not only knocks, but He calls our name personally because, well, He has a place in His family for you to be one of His children. And after you read the book of Revelation, one of the things you walk away with very clearly is, is I want to be a part of that. I don't want to miss out on that. I don't want you to miss out on that either. I want you to discover for yourself when you die that heaven is for real. Let us pray. Lord, you know that there's a, a lot of little deaths, a lot of things that make us cry and worry and fearful. Lord, that life on this planet is, is filled with a mixture. A mixture of joy and sorrow. A life of ease and a life of challenge. And Lord, we get it. We can think of a place that is nothing but challenge and difficulty and death. And Lord, we can think of a place that is well, only good, where goodness and truth and beauty reigns. And Lord, I'm thankful that you extend an invitation to each and every one of us to spend eternity with you. Lord, I'm thankful that you loved us enough that you came personally. That Lord, as you resurrected, we have the hope of resurrection. Lord, walk with us today. Help us to feel your presence and your power. Lord, help us to respond today to your invitation. Lord, be the leader of our life. Help us to empty our, our hands and our arms and our hearts, souls, and minds of that which prevents you from being the leader of our life, that the Lord, just in the asking, just in the admitting that we've been a little egotistical to say the least. That Lord, you forgive all of that. 
that you enter our life and, Lord, you give us a confirmation, not only with our lips, but, Lord, within our heart and our soul, that when we've asked you to be the leader of our life, you do enter our life and you change it not only now, but for all eternity. Amen.